already here. The fires and the extreme heat all over the world, in Europe, the hottest temperatures ever recorded in England, extreme weather in the forms of hurricanes and droughts, fires, floods, too much rain and too little rain, it's hard to deny that the earth is changing radically. And as, uh, as the, the, uh, the, the, the deep ecologist Freya Matthews of Australia has written, a loved place holds us, even if exists only in memory. It causes everything within it, including ourselves, to glow. A loved place is not encompassed by our love, we are encompassed, loved, and breathed into life by it. And when a place that we love is in trouble, whether it is endangered or damaged, or that we expect its endangerment or its damage, then we hurt too. We humans hurt too. It is time that we said to ourselves, yes, I recognize it. The earth as I know it is dying. Now the earth of self, of course, isn't dying. This planet has been remaking itself for four and a half billion years, flooding and thawing and thrusting up mountains and creating canyons, bursting with oceans, oceans disappearing into deserts. And the Earth will continue to do that for billions of years more. But what we have to recognize is something very important is coming to an end. And that is our relationship with the Earth as we know it the seasons, the predictability of rains, summer, snow, the arrival of certain birds and flowers in the spring. This is changing, and we need to, become, we need to acknowledge it in new forms. One way to do this is through earth, earth hospice. Now, hospice is a way of being with the dying. There's personal hospice, as we all know, my husband, Andy Gardner, died two years ago on Friday. And for about two, year, uh, two days and six hours before he died, he was in a hospice just north of Scranton, Pennsylvania. To my surprise, when I first went there to pick out a room for him, it was less like a clinic, which I had expected, than a small hotel. It had comfortable chairs, it had pictures on the walls. And there was not the... Uh, the noise and the rushing around and the beeping and the bright lights of a hospital. In a hospice, there's no, uh, there's no drastic measures to save life. Patients might be given uh, drugs to ease their pain or oxygen to make them breathe more easily, but they don't have feeding tubes and they don't, they don't receive CPR. When my husband arrived, he was conscious and even talkative he actually crowed about the fact that he had been driven in the back of an ambulance on a stretcher from the hospital and had recognized the route that the ambulance took, even though he was lying on his back in the back of it. And if you know my husband, you'll know how characteristic that was. On the second day, uh, he slept, slipped more and more frequently into um, unconsciousness or sleep, from which he only rarely emerged. He told his daughter on the phone that the world was getting smaller. He had uh, trouble, he said at one point that he couldn't die because something was holding him back, and so I did a simple ceremony for him. And the following day, he did not wake up, and at that night he died, on the night of the third day. What surprised me about my experience with hospice was how calm I was. I had never done anything like that before. I had never spent time with a dying person, and yet I regarded it as a very sacred task, a very grave and important task. And even though I, I, I was sad, of course, I didn't have that wrenching grief that I would have later when I got back home. It just seemed to me that there was something that I needed to do, that there was something that I could do, and that was to guide Andy to the place where we would have to part, and he would go on, and I would go on, and we would, our ways would be separate. So, what is hospice for the earth? Hospice for the earth would also be a time and a place to say goodbye, because that's what hospice is. Hospice is a place 
it is a time, it is a practice, and it is a way of thinking. It's acknowledging that life as we have known it cannot and will not continue, and we have to let go of clinging. For the person who is dying, it is a time to release, hopefully with peace, all of the life, all of the energies and the problems and the challenges of life, and to gently let go. And for the person who's with the dying person, the family, the loved ones, it's the beginning of the recognition that we, we, we are not going to be connected anymore, that we are going to, that we are going to separate. Earth hospice, like regular hospice, will be that time of saying goodbye. It will be a time of grieving. It will be a time of loving. It will be a time of remembering. And it will be a time of being together with that which we love and that we know we'll miss. We know that we can't fix a lot of things that are going to disappear with climate change or with all the many other kinds of environmental challenges we're facing. And that's our, that is our go-to response when things are broken. Something's broken, it has to be fixed. It has to be fixed now, the sooner the better. And of course that has to happen as we go further and further into the, the manifestations of climate change. And important actions are being taken. They're being taken by every one of us as we remember to eat less meat, to fly less often, to moderate the easy purchases that we can make online by simply clicking and having something arrive at our, our front door in a box a couple of days later. Things are being done all over the world to recognize that climate change is a reality and to deal with it. So for example, in Bangladesh, they are building schools that can float to withstand the rising of the ocean. For example, uh, they're build, they, they, they're putting, they have plastic drums with platforms over them and structures over the top of them so that the children can sit in these kind of like boat-like classrooms and learn. And right here in the eastern US, the Nature Conservancy is buying up uh, land to create a green corridor that will go up the Appalachian chain to facilitate the migratory routes of animals and birds. So things are being done. And yet, we have to recognize that something else needs to be done as we go through this process of climate change with the earth and with one another. And that is a kind of meditative, compassionate, ceremonial practice or practices. Earth Hospice will, was, first, uh, was first proposed by the writer Carolyn Baker in 2014. She wrote an article called plans for the planetary hospice. And in it, she urged us to respond to climate change in a way, she says, that is conscious grieving and an integral component of the maturity required to balance compassionate action with a discerning acceptance of our predicament. Now the time has come, it's, uh, it's only eight years later, but a lot has happened in that eight years. The time has come to recognize that we not only need to create measures for hospice, and I personally prefer Earth hospice to planetary hospice because there are many planets in the universe and there's only one Earth. The time has come to recognize that we have to start now, that it's not, it's not just an attitude we have to cultivate, but we need to begin as soon as possible, and we need some concrete actions. The practices of Earth Hospice will have to be very, very simple and adaptable and flexible so that they are relevant and meaningful to anybody around the world, no matter what their religion, their race, their nationality, their gender, or even their age. They will have to be so adaptable that they don't cost anything at all. They will have to be easy to do. They could be something that might be done on the spur of the minute, or it might be something that takes place over many weeks or months and is well planned out. It must be, could be done by one person or by a, uh, by, by a group. And these are practices that are spiritual, psychological, and relational. 
as more than they are practical and measurable, although, of course, they can accompany practices that are measurable. So here are just a few ideas. One, a vigil. A vigil is mindfully sitting with, that, with something, sitting with the passage of time and not doing anything but just being present. Now, the average stay in a hospice is two days. So, of course, a vigil for the earth is going to last a lot longer. Trees and frogs do not disappear in days or even weeks or even years. It's a much, much longer process. But we can still be present and attentive to that which we love and are missing, whether it's a tree in our own backyard that's dying of insect predation or whether it's glaciers in, the, in Antarctica. I actually did my first earth uh, vigil, Earth Hospice Vigil, without even calling it that, certainly without calling it Earth Hospice, about 25 years ago when Andy and I lived in Brooklyn, New York, and I was in my little office in the front of the house when I heard a loud roaring noise in the back, and I rushed back to see that this beautiful old maple tree in our yard was being cut down. It, it was a gorgeous big tree, huge, big, wide tree, and in the springtime and summer, it was filled with the songs of birds, just absolute chorus. In storms, it was wild. It blew in the wind. And in the winter, the snow on the bare branches etched all across the backyards in this uh, neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. And I was so devastated that I just sank down by the window and stayed there for about two hours, weeping talking to the tree, apologizing it, and telling how beautiful it was. That was, a, that was a vigil for something that was dying. It didn't help the tree, at least not that I know of, who knows these things, but it was a way of staying in relation. And with earth hospices, with human hospice, when we sit without making anything happen, without checking the phone or reading or getting something to eat, Something happens, we come into deeper relationship with what's there. We start noticing little changes in the light and in the wind and in the way that things move all around. Something magical happens where we become a little less filled with ourselves and that which we're sitting with becomes a little less itself and we seem to meet in this place in the middle. It's really a beautiful practice, this vigil. And it doesn't have to last days, you know, it could last a few minutes and repeatedly. So another practice for Earth Hospice would be ceremony. Now a ceremony is an event that takes place in a particular place at a limited time and with specific gestures, and it portends uh, or expresses an intention for something that will take longer and in, over a vast period of time and in many places and in all kinds of gestures. So for example, a wedding, two people love each other, they get married, they have a wedding ceremony, they create vows, and the whole thing takes place in maybe an hour, but the intention is that it will be uh, a model for how they want to live their whole life. So ceremonies for Earth could be very, very flexible. They could include storytelling, embracing, stepping over thresholds, uh, cutting, repairing, all things just done in person on, at, at a place that's in danger. Uh, two women from Santa Fe did a really beautiful ceremony as part of a, a ceremony from my organization, Radical Joy for Hard Times. They uh, wanted to uh, give something back to land in a dry cleaning plant that had become uh, poisoned when the chemicals from the dry cleaning uh, leached into the leached into the ground. And so they began by going to the uh, Santuary de Shimayo, uh, and which is known to have been the source of many, many uh, miraculous healings. And they got water from a well, and they put it in some bottles. And then they went up to the dry cleaning plant, and they walked all around the periphery, putting water into the earth, all around the periphery of this dry cleaning plant and making prayers and offerings that the land would be restored and healed. Another form of uh, doing practice for Earth Hospice would be gift giving. When somebody is in hospice, 
we, uh, we will often bring them a, a soft blanket or music or flowers to make the environment beautiful and to ease their passage. And for the earth too, we can give, uh, we can give gifts. We can give uh, flowers, we can give song, we can give dance, we can give music. Um, there are all kinds of ways to give gifts for the earth. My organization, uh, Radical Joy for Hard Times, does a ceremony every year in June where we give gifts for the earth and people all over the world participate. It's very, very simple. People go to these places that are hurt or endangered, share stories, get to know the place as it is now, and then they make a gift for the place out of materials that are found there on site. And it's been done by scientists in Antarctica, farmers in Bali. Um, we've done them twice here at UUCB, once by the Susquehanna River and once uh, here in the uh, collaboration with, uh, U with CUPS and with Green Sanctuary. So it's, it's really, uh, it's just a way of giving back to the earth, which has given so much to us. And the final element that I would talk about today as part of Earth Hospice is amazement. And amazement has to happen with all the other pieces. And it can happen whether you're doing them or not. We have to recognize the continuity of the Earth, the resilience, the stamina, the creativity that continues to go on no matter what else is happening. We can say hello to the Earth and all its beauty even as we are saying goodbye. Now, obviously, Earth Hospice will not be an easy practice. It will be a long-term practice. We will have to teach our children and our grandchildren how to do these ceremonies and practices that they can pass it on to their children and grandchildren. It will be a long struggle, and it will be a beautiful struggle. It will make our life as we go through this difficult change more beautiful, more meaningful, more in touch with the earth. It will give us hope. And we will come to know more intimately the places that we're grieving as we pay, as we pay attention to them. We will recall over and over again the, the intimate connection between what's happening in the world around us and what's happening in our own hearts. We will gain new appreciation for the resilience and the, the stubbornness, the creativity of the earth. And we will find things in common with our neighbors and our community who also care about the places we care about. And that, that we will discover that that love of place transcends all kinds of other more superficial differences. We will have with the awakening that we have the power not always to change what's happening on the earth and the climate, but we do have the power to change how we respond to that. And that is very big, that kind of empowerment. And finally, we will just open up anew to the beauty of the Earth, the beauty of this small blue planet in the midst of the cosmos. So let us give Earth hospice. Let us start today. Let us give back to the Earth, which has given so much to us. And now, if you are able,